My name is Kathleen McLean. I'm a programmer here at the Art Gallery of Ontario, and it's my pleasure to see so many of you here for tonight's talk by Gary Gerls about Via Selmans. Uh, I'd like to start by acknowledging where we are and the obligations that we have as hosts or guests and treaty people on this territory. The AGO operates on land that is the territory of the Anishinaabe, Mississauga Nation, and was also the territory of the Wendat and the Haudenosaunee. The Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant is an agreement between the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the Anishinaabe Three Fires Confederacy to peaceably share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. Toronto is also governed by a treaty between the Federal Government of Canada and the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation and has always been a trading center for First Nations. Um, so, Via Salmons to fix the image and memory is a striking and exquisite exhibition of five decades of Via Salmons art featuring, I think, over 110 works. We're really lucky to have the exhibition here on the AGO's fifth floor on view through August 5th. The exhibition is co-organized by the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art and the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And thanks are due to our presenting partner, Max Mara. Um, the exhibition was generously supported by Cecily and Robert Bradshaw, Phil Lind, and Ellen Rowland. And we'd like to thank our government partner, the Canada Council for the Arts. Of course, we're very grateful to exhibition curator Gary Garrels for being with us in Toronto tonight. Gary is the Elise S. Haas Senior Curator of Painting and Sculpture at SF MoMA. Previously, he's held appointments at the Hammer Museum in LA, the Museum of Modern Art in New York, the Walker Arts Center in Minneapolis, and the DIA Art Foundation. Gerald's has curated and organized many exhibitions throughout his career. I will not name them all, but I'll do some, some highlights. Uh, for SF MoMA, Bruce Connor, It's All True, and Richard Serra Drawing a Retrospective. At the Hammer, it was um, Oranges and Sardines, Conversations on Abstract Painting, and Eden's Edge, 15 LA Artists. And for the Museum of Modern Art, Bryce Marden, A Retrospective of Paintings and Drawings, and Roth Time, a Dieter Roth Retrospective. Uh, following Gary's talk, We'll have some time for questions, uh, but before Gary begins, I'd like to welcome the AGO's Carolyn Morton Rapp, Curator of Contemporary and Modern Art, Kitty Scott, to say a few words. Um, good evening and welcome everybody. Uh, Thank you for coming out on um, what's turning to sort of be still a winter's day, I think. So uh, maybe it's a little bit warmer out there than since I started this morning. No, it's still cold out there? Okay, so thank you. Anyway, thank you for coming out. Um, uh, I, would, I would first like to say uh, working on this exhibition for me has really just been two years. But um, for Gary, uh, it's been a 10-year a ten-year process. So two years ago, the AGO got in contact with him and uh, we had some conversations and we started working out what uh, could possibly happen here. And Gary's been an incredibly generous colleague and uh, the exhibition, meeting Via and learning about the exhibition and working with Ian Altavir from the Met uh, has been uh, really a uh, a great process and I've learned a huge amount from it and I think you know when you work on any any project you're always as a as a as a curator I think hoping to learn new things so it's been incredibly rich and rewarding uh, it is not you know my project per se it's really Gary uh, uh, with Ian and um, I think the show upstairs uh, speaks volumes it's Absolutely uh, stunning and amazing. I don't. Uh, I'm not a person who's given to these kinds of words very often. I don't. I don't speak like this. But uh, I feel very strongly about what's going on upstairs. If you haven't seen it, please take the time and uh, spend the time that it it asks of you. I think it'll be an incredibly rewarding experience. Um, I would really like to welcome Gary on the stage now, and he'll tell you uh, more about this exhibition in depth and more about, I think, Via's incredible uh, working process as well. So, welcome, Gary. Thanks, thanks, Kitty. Um, um, you know, it's often uh, said. Uh, that works of art cannot be fully experienced as reproduced images. Uh, and I think in the Selman's case, this is especially true. 
Uh, her works are more than images. They reflect an extraordinary attention to materials. They possess an extraordinary level of detail and subtlety, subtlety that can only be grasped in a physical encounter. Their intensity and seduction that occurs in their presence is impossible to capture through images. So you'll just bear with me tonight as I show you a lot of images. And of course, I am so happy that all of you may have an opportunity to actually see the works themselves uh, at some point in the future. So, <clears throat> with a career spanning more than 50 years, Via Salmons has been celebrated by curators, critics, art historians, and very much other artists. Her work has been avidly collected by a wide range of museums and a number of private collectors. And I have to say, I was just walking through the galleries today and was so pleased to turn a corner and find this exquisite display of prints of Via Salmons. So you've got wonderful things here in the collection. Um, but um, perhaps the, her, she's almost unknown, actually, I think, to a more general public. And perhaps this is true because for a career of such length, there are relatively few uh, finished works. Her, the entirety of her career is about 300 works. Um, her compositions rarely include color. They are tonal, primarily an array of blacks and grays. Uh, almost all of her works are relatively small in scale. Uh, almost half of her works are drawings, which are rarely accessible or visible. Um, the last large museum survey in North America was in 1992. Um, uh, I, um, I've been very fortunate, I have to say, uh, 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 that I first encountered Via's work by chance. I was in New York City in 1982 for her first exhibition in New York, which included the sculpture that, from which the uh, exhibition takes its name, to fix the image in memory. Uh, I was able to see her mid-career survey in 1992, and I uh, met her in 1998. Um, and, um, was able to bring to Los Angeles at the Hammer Museum uh, a European retrospective of her drawings uh, in 2006. And it was at that point that I thought, this is an artist who needs a full retrospective, and I began a conversation with Via. Um, and as Kitty mentioned, it's been about 10 years uh, in the making through many ups and downs, paths, detours and for both of us. And I am really thrilled it's, it's here. Um, I love the way Via uses language. Uh, and I want to start with a passage from a notebook uh, dated 1980. Um, and uh, it is the title of the sculpture uh, I mentioned from 1982 and the title of the exhibition. Quote, to fix the image in memory, not for itself, but for clarity and balance, art offers its beautiful stillness, a sense of wonder constructed over time, sustained emotions. She is what I would call a singular artist. She began her career in Los Angeles, uh, where she became one of the few female artists in the 1960s to be recognized by her male peers and develop a significant standing. Uh, in the early 80s, she moved to New York and again is one of the few artists to be embraced by art communities in both of these coasts. She's never aligned herself with a movement or been closely associated with any group of artists. She's avoided adhering to any particular theory. Um, she was born uh, in Riga, Latvia in 1938. In 1944, as Soviet troops were about to invade, uh, the family fled uh, to Germany where they stayed in refugee camps for four years. In 1948, through the auspices of a Christian church group, the family was resettled in the United States in Indianapolis. <clears throat> she came basically the age of 10, uh, not knowing English, and taught herself to speak and read English by listening to the radio and reading comic books. She, however, had from an early age was obsessed with drawing 
And drawing became a primary activity for her then as a young woman uh, in America, unable to really communicate directly. Uh, by the time she graduated from high school in 1957, she was very recognized for her talent as an artist. And she enrolled in the Heron School of Art, which is affiliated with the Indiana Indianapolis Museum of Art. Um, in 1961, she was awarded a, a fellowship for Yale Summer School, um, and there she met uh, artists who would become lifelong friends, including uh, Bryce Martin and uh, Chuck Close, and for the first time met artists coming up from New York who were, had fully developed careers. And she realized at that point that being a painter, being an artist, was a possible way of life, was a possible career. <clears throat> she graduated in 1962 from the Heron and, and had a travel fellowship and for the first time was able to return to Europe. And she went to the Prado for the first time in uh, Madrid and was completely uh, overtaken by the work of Velazquez. She went to Italy, went to the Arena Chapel in Padua and saw the Giotto frescoes, which remained both Velazquez and Giotto remained very important for her among other, among other artists. Um, in 1962, after Europe, she had been awarded a full fellowship to study at UCLA, and so she moved to Los Angeles. Um, and um, in 1963, found a large empty space not far from the beach in Venice, California, which then became her studio for the next 13 years. She dates her first mature work to 1964, a series of still lives of objects from her studio. With these canvases, she jettisoned her art school training, unburdening herself of approaches of an earlier generation of influential artists, finding her own way of painting. Quote, I thought I would sit down without all my theories, without any theories and aesthetics, I was going to start in a more primitive place with just my eyes and my hand. It was a process of, quote, trying to throw away all the things that I thought I had learned, but not from my own doing, but that were from magazines, from other people's ideas. I was trying to get back to some kind of basic thing where I just look and paint. Uh, <clears throat> the... Um, uh, these, these paintings, these, uh, she painted everything in her studio then for the next year. Um, and exhausting the studio, she then turned to painting from uh, clippings. Oops, oh, sorry, back, back. She, and she would occasionally uh, make objects. Um, these are all in the exhibition. These are, are wood that were uh, hand carved and then carefully painted. As she said, they became objects that fell out of the picture plane. She um, <clears throat> then began working from clippings from magazines, books, newspapers. Um, and uh, this was a time in 1965 where in the United States the Vietnam War was escalating drastically. It became a subject of television every night. In Los Angeles, the Watts race riots broke out in the summer. Uh, and she said it became a time for her where all many of the memories of her youth returned. She said it was a time of soot and trains and bombs from my early times. And so these paintings were, uh, uh, became the subjects, and you'll see, see these upstairs. And I will say as an aside, this is precisely the time that Gerhard Richter began painting his paintings from World War II of those memories of his family and so forth. But of course, Richter and Selmans were completely unknown to each other. So it was just a, a completely parallel uh, development. So over the next three years, she followed the standard format she had developed with the studio still lives. The imagery centered, isolated. She avoided compositional structures. She is devoid of expressive brush strokes. The, the images are rendered almost solely in subdued tones, predominantly grays, a palette that allowed her to avoid decisions about color. She thought that rather than inventing her subjects, her aim was, quote, to read, describe them. And the 
Resulting paintings and drawings are examples of extreme distillation paired back from simple descriptive rendering. They have an intense physicality. Materiality is, important, is as important as the image. <clears throat> this is a very unusual painting in her career. She began to take photographs, and this is an image she was then teaching at uh, the University of California at Irvine, which is uh, south of Los Angeles, and she began commuting between Venice and, uh, and Irvine and set a camera up on the windshield of her car and took, took images. And this, for the first time, is a work where it's made out of the studio where it's a, a work where it's the, uh, from her again, a photograph uh, that she had taken herself, but for the first time, the sky, the space of Southern California entered the work. <clears throat> a profound breakthrough occurred, though, in 1968 uh, when she rejected painting and she turned to graphite, which she felt could make, uh, e e there was even less subjectivity in it, and she could make a, a more distilled, striking image. The first works were, again, from clippings, again, from newspapers, magazines, and sometimes, again, uh, involving uh, war images or, again, memories from the past. And uh, I will say this particular drawing here is one of my favorite works in the exhibition, The Letter. Um, it is a letter that her mother had sent her in 1966. And it sat in the studio for two years, and then she decided to draw it. And if you see what appear to be five stamps, those are actually five very small drawings of war scenes, which are collaged onto the letter. It's the only collage in her career. But the most drastic, and I would say the most fundamental change occurred when she began to take her own photographs and um, began to work with a new subject, the ocean. <clears throat> which carried a symbolism that went far beyond the studio, far beyond the events of daily life, I would say even beyond the events of human history. These drawings have become her most well-known, her most iconic works, and they mark the beginning of an approach that had taken years to mature and emerge. Um, and so um, I'm going to dwell a little more with a little more time on, on the ocean drawings because they really are the foundation for the, the rest of her career. Um, the, um, and I'm going to quote Via quite extensively. I think because she didn't learn English until she was uh, 10, she has a quite distinctive way of using language. And I think it has a vividness that really captures the essence of, of her thinking and, and the work. So you'll, you'll hear a lot of her voice here rather than mine. Um, so she said, one decision that I was going back to a more abstract kind of work, a kind of double reality where there's an image, but the image is here in another form. And when you look at the work, you have that double thing you should have all the time where you're looking at the making, a kind of re-describing of the surface, and the image is interwoven with that surface. I wanted an image that was in your mind, that was vast, and the reality which was very refrained, restrained and flat and made and that was actual. I like to work with impossible images, impossible because they are nonspecific, too big, spaces unbound, I'm always interested in images that break up the space into tiny areas so there's a movement to it that engages you. I'm interested in that constant tension and shifting between the feeling of depth and a strict adherence to the reality of the two-dimensional plane. I feel that the image is just a sort of armature on which I hang my marks and make my art. These first broken surface images were a way to articulate the surface of the drawing in a cubist way with individual marks that break up the surface and then build up into a whole. I want a form that's a very thorough structure. I want the feeling that the image was developed as far as it could go and that it can stand a lot of inspection. <clears throat> 
These ocean drawings were derived from photographs she took on evening walks with her dog on the Venice Pier and Venice Beach, not far from the studio. And as she brought them back to the studio and she scrutinized them over time, she developed a, quote, affection for certain little areas that she then re-examined all the time. The sizing and proportions of the drawings were crucial. To stay focused on specific areas, Selman's laid grids over the photographs, which were much, much smaller than the compositions. She worked from the lower right corner to the upper left, using a bridge to keep her hand from touching the surface. She never used an eraser. The images were formed by different strokes and densities of marks. Highlights were created by allowing portions of the paper to support to remain vis visible. If a mistake was made, the drawing was abandoned. Quote, every little mark that I made was a mark that fit with the image, fit with the surface, and fit with the space. It was a matter then of maintaining an even tension so the surface was just lying there. The relationship between paper and image became, quote, everything. The edge and approaching the edge are important events in my work, especially since the image is defined by it. At the edges, one breaks the illusion of a continuous space and sees the making process and that the work is really a fiction. With few exceptions, Selmans prefers her drawings to be shown without mats, enhancing their character as objects, not framed windows to an illusion. Quote, I don't want to make a pictorial picture where you might imagine a horizon and what's over that horizon. For similar reasons, Selmans, Selmans used simple paper that would, quote, be a clear support. I don't like the paper saying something about itself. She then applied a thin ground, a ground of thin acrylic to prevent the graphite from being absorbed. And as she put it, the paper has a skin and I put another skin on it. Throughout her career, Selmans has returned repeatedly to the same subjects. Quote, I tend to do images over and over again because each one has a different tone, slant, a different relationship to the plane, and so a different meaning. Of her process, she says, I let the drawing go where it takes me. There are millions of decisions, of course, when you're working on something, so I try to be alive and present for that moment. It's a kind of record of moments of attention. <clears throat> the ocean was her primary subject from the late 60s through the early 70s and even as far uh, as 1977. Uh, in the earliest oceans, the wave structures are bolder. There's a stronger movement. The darker and lighter areas are more contrasting. The images are heavily grounded in the lower section of the drawing. By the 1970s, the surfaces begin to even out. They begin to be lighter and more luminous. In later drawings, they're more, the waves are more even, more regular. The tone of the pencil is kept in check. The images are more flat with a slight indication of perspective. The image and the paper fully merged. Um, although the majority of these drawings measure between 12 and 14 inches high and just under or over 18 inches wide, she introduced many variations in scale and composition. And actually, I'll back up. There are two of these which are, are for her, very large drawings and only two. And she made a couple of these drawings uh, where she worked in, using the same image but using a different hardness of pencil. So going from a very hard, tough, tight pencil to an increasingly soft one so that by the time you get to the cross this range of seven images, you get a much lusher, softer uh, representation of the image. <clears throat> In the late 60s and around the same time that she was taking the photographs of the ocean, Satellites were capturing photographs of the moon in space as American and Soviet astronauts raced to reach its surface. Attracted by the range of silvery grays in these images and the complex process of their transmission from outer space to Earth and to the printed page, Selmans began collecting pictures of the moon from newspapers, magazines, and again books. 
Her large personal archive became the basis for a small number of drawings. The images selected, de selected determined the character of the compositions, and like her Ocean series, these works faithfully document any camera distortion, glare, or blurriness. The subject was the photograph, she's noted, so whatever the photograph told me, I did, and I found a great freedom in this. Selman sometimes would complicate these uh, images with uh, placing pictures on top of one another or doubling or enlarging details. Her shifts emphasize the constructed nature of the image, their distance from, direct, from directly observed reality. Um, Selmans has always been, uh, always had a circle of friends of artists around her uh, as a student and uh, again living in Venice, uh, she was surrounded by uh, a number of artists and, and one of her early friends at this point was Frank Gehry and uh, she was so pleased to, uh, uh, when the, the idea came up of showing here at the Art Gallery of Ontario that uh, she would for the first time be showing her work in a building by her dear friend Frank. And in the late 60s, she became friends with uh, the artist James Terrell and Doug Wheeler, who were, are known for their, quote, light and space installations. Um, so again, the issue of the light and space of California was a primary, uh, a primary attention. And both Jim and Doug were, or were pilots, and Via would go out flying with them in their planes and going over the desert. She began to take a real interest in it and began taking walks in the desert and focusing on the vast expanse of the desert and the, even, and the night sky. So in the 70s, her interest remained on drawing, but now complementing the oceans with images of deserts and galaxies, often developed in relation to one another. The Coma Bernices uh, series, for example, is rendered as a series of four drawings, all from 1973, which you can see upstairs. Again, each in a different grade of pencil, from soft to hard, so the tone varies from gray to almost black. The depictions of the desert floor often show the same detail, but in each image, there's a shift in scale. When the galaxies and deserts are juxtaposed, the differences are dramatic. The night skies have a central focus they do not, that they don't possess in nature, while the desert floors have, bis, have been disengaged from a larger landscape and become almost completely abstract. In the night skies, the areas of the paper that have not been covered with pencil appear as bright highlights, forming the ostensible subject. While in the desert drawing, Selman's used her pencil to render what appear to be shadows, creating the illusion of small rocks in relief. A larger shift occurred in 1977 when her personal life was somewhat unsettled and she became frustrated with the artistic boundaries she'd set for herself. She spent a lot of time in Arizona, New Mexico, and where she began gathering river stones keeping those that, she, that, quote, had galaxies on them. Quote, I carried them around in the trunk of my car, I put them on windowsills, I lined them up, and finally they formed a set, a kind of constellation. Remembering Jasper John's early bronzes of everyday objects, she decided to cast the stones in bronze, and for the first time in many years, took up painting again, meticulously recreating the twin of each stone, quote, I developed this desire to try and put them into an art context, sort of mocking art in a way, and also to affirm the act of making, the act of looking and making as a primal act of art. She's also described the project as, quote, a piece that was as devoid as possible from manipulation, ego, idealization, distortion, just moments of consciousness. The work was begun in Los Angeles, but finished in New York, bridging the life and art attached to each place. And when it was shown for the first time in New York in 1982, Selman settled on the title to fix the image in memory, <clears throat> which, as I quoted before, came from a notebook notation in 1980. And it's a phrase that I think concisely summarizes the essence of Selman's work, its emphasis on looking, materializing, and remembering. 
For the next 10 years, Selmans continued to seek a way back into painting. She said, I wanted the work to carry more weight. There are more possibilities with painting because they have a feeling of, some, of a form that's bigger just because there's more layering. There are more shifts in the work. It's just more complicated spatial experience. And so what we see here is one of the very, very last drawings she made where she saturated the paper as intensely as possible with graphite that she couldn't lay down any more pencil on the paper. And again, the white is letting just the paper show through where the graphite has not over covered it. And this is the very first painting, uh, which uh, she spent a couple years on and, and has layers and layers of paint. These are also, uh, you see between 1988 and 92, she makes a few very small paintings going back to subjects of drawings, but now translating it into paint. Um, but in 1992, the year of the mid-career survey at the Institute of Contemporary Art in Philadelphia, Selman settled on her focus, the night sky, a subject which with her work has been now been strongly identified. The earliest of her paintings of this subject are dense black fields with intermittent bursts of white. Later works balance white spots, flex against the dark ground, and then paintings in which the black gives way to luminous grays encrusted with shimmering white orbs. Selman's interest in their materiality is clear. She has said, the black invites you in. You come close, and then you're kept out by their physical flatness. I like the emotion this interaction creates. I think the work has an emotional quality that comes out of the phys manipulated physicality. And I want to just describe a little bit, and again, in her words, the process of making these paintings. <clears throat> Quote, I first draw in a pattern that breaks the surface, and then I draw the different sizes of circles for the stars. Next, with a small sable brush, I apply a tiny drop of liquid rubber. It hardens, and I build it up to a desirable thickness. And then I paint layers of ivory blacks mixed with burnt umber, ultramarine blue, sometimes a bit of white. And I use alcot, which takes about two days to dry. And once it's dry, I take them off with little rubber bumps, which create those little holes with various kinds of white mixed with a bit of cerulean blue and sometimes a bit of raw umber or yellow ochre. She uses a combination of titanium and zinc white for the whites. And she, quotes, keeps filling those holes until they come up to the same level as the black surface. And I sand it off a little and the whole surface is totally uniform, flat, a very tight skin. Sometimes there are as many as 20 or more layers. Quote, they were black and then sanded off and black and sanded off, so the black became total black, reflecting no light. And sometimes I get a layer that doesn't sit right and I have to redo the whole thing. And in that way, I think time is in the work. She remains keenly aware of the perceptual effects this labor creates, noting that the work quote, begins to have a strange quality when you get to a certain point. It lets you in for a little bit and you think you may be seeing something that isn't there. You get the feeling of a fuller space and some solid structure underneath. In 1994, she returned to drawing again, feeling that the night skies had become too tight, too compounded. But again, with the night sky as a primary subject, but now working with charcoal rather than graphite. Quote, I started the drawings because I was beginning to think my painting was getting too concentrated, too tight, and I wanted to make work that was a little more open, maybe more gesture in there with my hand. So I picked a fluid, dusty, malleable material like charcoal to try to trick myself into this mode. She would apply the charcoal in layers, often, again, using fingers, hand. She would then work back into the white paper using various erasers, some soft, some hard, some able to be shaped into a point, and even electric erasers, so that she was, quote, drawing by removing the black, just the opposite of the pencil drawings. Some of the night sky drawings have no ground added to the paper, while some are on coated paper. Selman's notes, when you're further away, you think, oh yes, there is an image, and it's a sky image. And then you come up close, and it becomes just charcoal that has let light in. Light and charcoal, light and the absence of it. 
These compositions are smaller in size than the painting, and when the viewer approaches a drawing, Selman says, the whole thing is revealed, the fact that it's made. <clears throat> Um, I can't talk about every body of work, but I did want to show, uh, this is again one of, of, a favorite of mine, and it's a very small subject. There are only a handful of these drawings and paintings of a web, and the first web painting was made in 1992 as she was exploring painting again, and then she didn't come back to it until 1998, and again, a very small body of work. And again, the drawings are erasure drawings, so layering down the charcoal and then going in erasing to create the image of a spider's web. As she said, she loved seeing the spider's web in a, in a garden, just that flat plane suspended in space. <clears throat> um, but um, in, the, in the past uh, 10 years, uh, starting roughly 2007, uh, Selman's has taken a new subject, uh, children's slate ch uh, chalkboards. Um, and again, these were things she began bringing back to the studio in the 1980s, um, and they were things remembered from childhood. Uh, and they would sit, they sat accumulating in the studio, um, and soon as she said she had a collection, I looked at them every day and I always liked the grays and the blacks, so it was natural I would make something out of them one day. She realized that each of the tablets was quite, quite close to the black paintings, except that instead of an artist's made surface, its surface was made already by school kids and time. Beautiful black grays made by someone else. She engaged her friend, Edward Finnegan, a sculptor and a furniture maker, to duplicate some of the tablets, which she then painted. She noted, quote, I always pick the objects, so I'm already composing and picking and making my own kind of a poem. As with the stones, she combined the found slates with her fabrications. The largest group to date, which you see here, Blackboard Tableau Number 1, worked on over a period of three years, is composed of 10 tablets. Each <clears throat> of the seven made tablets has a slight shift in tonality, grayish, bluish, green-toned, ruddy black, and both the front and the back are painted meticulously so she could decide at the time of installation which side would face the viewer. For Selman's, the combination of found and made objects creates, quote, an invitation to look harder than you would look normally. And so everybody goes by and has a double take on it and maybe a little smile comes out of it. Over the past 20 years, Selman's work has grown more open, more expansive, she is, is more direct in painting the night skies with less sanding and building them up. Their opacity is less severe. Their surfaces more readily invite the viewer to enter. Um, and occasionally color pervades their darkness. She's also worked at a larger scale. And for the first time returning to the dimensions of the, uh, the, the night sky. And she's also introduced uh, other new subjects. Uh, again, I think things that often refer back to her own past, remembered days of school, of history. Um, and this, again, is one of my favorite works in the exhibition, Japanese Notebook, which was a used notebook she found in a, I believe it was a flea market in, in Tokyo. And uh, she just loved the feel and look of it. And again, it came back to the studio. And again, over a couple years, she began uh, Re, as she says, re-describing it. Um, <clears throat> I also love it because, it, as again, it's a, it implies someone's li lived life and the traces of that life left on the surface of the notebook. Um, she also took a radical new approach, choosing a light rather than a dark ground, a reverse night sky. Darkened highlights, and you can just barely see it over here, but darkened highlights echo the stars, touches of color enliven and enrich the ground. The reverse night sky is a challenging subject because the space, she quotes, is more implied, less fixed. The white paintings have a shifting, ambiguous space that's hard for me to accept. I paint them many times. Every now and then I see something new happening, and then I lose it. 
And she, is, uh, and she said, recently, this is a subject that's become a greater focus. And she's now rendered it in several variations. As with the softer, more open charcoal drawings of the night sky, in contrast to the dense and closed surfaces of the earlier night skies, the space in the reverse night skies is, quote, much more ambiguous. It's like a fog. You really can't tell where you're at. <clears throat> Uh, and I'm going to end with this, um, which is um, uh, in, uh, we see here, and I'm going to describe this, it's really hard to see, I'm so sorry, this, the images, but this is six canvases spread across quite an expansive space. And the canvas closest to me was a painting of an ocean that she'd made in 1986-87. And it was bought by a very dear friend of hers, and when that friend died, she left it back to Via. And so Via had it in the studio and was living with it again um, decades after it was, uh, had first been painted and then returned to her. And after living with it in the studio, she decided to paint five variations. And this was done over a period of four years, slightly changing the size and the palette of each one. And quote, I started it about 30 years ago, and I found I had a different relationship to it. Perhaps time and my own age somehow changed. <clears throat> changed my handwriting. Or I'm different in every moment. Making the same image as different, as <clears throat> making the same image at different periods in, in my life is interesting for me. <clears throat> when Selmans began her career as an artist, she set out ambitious goals aiming to make work that was, quote, quote, was original, work that I felt I could connect, work that let, went along with my whole feeling for life and my understanding of where I should be and work that reflected things I'd seen. She set out to pair art back to its essence, to remove gesture, composition, the personality of the artist, to give the work as much autonomy as possible. And I quote, I remember being inspired to imagine what is art if, re if you remove all those things, she said. What was left was a kind of poetic reminder of how little a work of art really is and how elusive it is to chase the part that excites you and turns one thing into something else and how tiny that part is and how hard it is to define. She's quite emphatic that she does not intend a spiritual message in her work, but rather locates meaning and expression in, quote, the physical structure of the work, its inventiveness, sense of form. These are the things that come up making the work, and it gives me great pleasure discovering it, uh, it in other art. As she notes, if you really look at an image, look at a work, it stays in your memory. Then memory does other things to it. Sometimes a work fades. Sometimes it stays. Sometimes you have to run back and see if you remember it correctly. It's an alive experience, a give and take. So I'm going to end with that, and we can have some time for questions, uh, response. So thank you very much. Question right here in the first row. Hi again. Um, I would like to know what do you find captivating about a material work? Uh, the, the the works have an intense physical presence, and again, that's why it's so uh, a, um, such a betrayal to be showing them, you know, as these kind of projected images. Um, and uh, that there's an intensity to them. I mean, I think, at least for me, I feel the, the making of them, and I feel the duration of time that has brought these works into a kind of physical, visual reality. 
And there is something quite, um, it's still quite mysterious, you know. I mean, it's uh, that how these things have taken a presence in the world uh, through obviously an, an intensive process. And with the drawings, if you really look, you can see the hundreds, thousands of marks that, that make up each one. And with the paintings, it's just this extraordinary density that uh, uh, one, one feels. Uh, and again, the kind of, as she says, the, the line between thinking you recognize something as an image and then it falls apart and just becomes a kind of physical object. Uh, and its materiality is really what is most uh, present and expressive. Um, so I don't know if that answers, but maybe an attempt. I see another hand over here. Friendship with um, James. Sorry, could you say anything more about the friendship with um, James Terrell and yeah. Mike, Michael Heiser? I think uh, you not said. Michael. No, it was Jim and Doug Wheeler, oh. an artist who's not not so well known as as Jim, but but a very key figure in that movement. Uh, maybe I'll backtrack a little bit. When she was at UCLA, uh, one of her instructors was Robert Irwin. And this was in 1963. It was just the moment when Irwin was beginning to, to, to let painting go. He did, did some of his very last paintings that year. And he and Via got in intensive arguments about whether painting had any potential or future, which she believed it absolutely did. And she was absolutely committed as a painter, just as Irwin was letting go of paintings to make his like, kind of floating objects and then, you know, installations. And she became friends uh, with Jim and Doug, I think in about 1967, again, living in Venice Beach. And uh, they were very good friends. Uh, and her, uh, uh, for, uh, her opening, at, or she worked with a, a wonderful Japanese-American woman named Riko Mizuno, who had one of the great galleries in LA at the time. And it was Jim Terrell who introduced Via's work to Rico. So he was an advocate. And, and, and through that relationship, she had her first show. And for the first show, uh, Rico, I think working with Jim, filled the courtyard of her gallery with artificial snow. And they had a snow party uh, for her opening. So it was a very you know, playful, full, wonderful relationship. And I have to say, she's still very close to Doug, they, they, who is quite reclusive. He lives primarily in New Mexico, but they, uh, uh, they, they stay in touch. So, yeah. There's a question down here. Thank you. Uh, I think her paintings of, uh, based on photographs reminded me of uh, the works from Gerhard Richter, which yeah. I see from uh, MoMA probably like two weeks ago. So yeah. from curating this exhibition, can you talk more about how you find the relationship between paintings, photography, and reality. Well, that's a big topic. It's, it's covered uh, very well in the catalog, I might say. I have a wonderful catalog, uh, and the issue of photography is uh, the subject of one of the, one of the essays. Um, for me, Richter, and I mean, I know the work very well. I love Richter. Uh, and I was, um, there have been a couple of shows, actually, uh, a colleague of mine, Russell Ferguson, who are, also wrote for the catalog, did a show at the Hammer Museum a few years ago dealing with photography and the image, which included Richter and Selmans and other artists like Richard Hamilton and, and so on. And then Ralph Rugoff, who's doing this year's Venice Biennale, when he was in London, uh, uh, organized a show also, which put together Richter and Selmans. Uh, I think for Europeans was the first time they became aware of that. Um, for me, Richter is, he's, I mean, again, and, you know, Richter is dealing with the, the uh, deception of the image, uh, the, um, you know, the betrayal of the image and uh, uh, making it unstable, you know, making it uncertain, uh, making sure that you understand how constructed and ambiguous and, and duplicitous an image is. And for me with Via, the image is, as she said, it's a, an armature for making a work of art. It's an armature for adding marks. It's an armature for, for adding paint. The image itself, as she said, is really, and of course I don't believe everything artists ever tell me, but you know, it's not really the subject that concerns her. Uh, 
but obviously there's an attraction to certain kinds of subjects. I mean, like the desert, the ocean, the night sky, which are these vast experiences outside of human scale, outside of human history, and trying and bringing those down to this very intimate, immediate kind of experience. So anyway, but I, th I think that's the essential difference, and and there may be art historians or others in the audience who may under, have a different or better understanding of that than I do, and I certainly welcome other comments on this. Another question here in front with Kitty. We'll let you answer, ask a question. <laughs> Hi, um, as, as I said, I've really enjoyed uh, my part in this project, um, working with you, et cetera, but you know, one of, one of the things I've, I've never done is done a show that is looking at an artist who's been working for almost 80 years. And in a sense, when you approach a task like that, I'd love to hear you talk about the kinds of challenges that you face, maybe the joys and the challenges, in a sense, what, what's hard about it, what came easy. Hmm. Um, well, I'll tell you, the hardest thing was that Via lets, she doesn't let a lot out of the studio. Uh, and so if something is let out of the studio, it's good. And, and so there were really hard choices about, you know, which works to show. As I said, there, it's, it's hard. So uh, the, there are, uh, it's not quite clear how to, you know, count them, but there are maybe 26, 27 ocean drawings, 28 maybe. Uh, how many we have here, 12 or something like that? Anyway, um, I have to I say, the thing that was actually most terrifying to me um, was, uh, and I'll get back to more of the question, but was that if there were a disaster in one of the museums where this exhibition is being held, uh, in San Francisco, we had almost half of her entire life's work on view. <laughs> and that was terrifying, taking that responsibility for this work. Um, the, um, I have to say that it was a pleasure. Uh, I, you know, just so wonderful to see the work in reality after you've been looking, you know, for years at reproductions, and it never failed. Uh, we'd go to a museum, go into the storeroom, go to a collector's home, see something that the work just like ignited in front of you uh, after seeing the reproductions. It it never failed, uh, and that was just such a affirmation and such a pleasure. Uh, to have that experience over and over and over again. Um, I mean, I felt it was important to create a, uh, I mean, the, to really understand the way the work developed, the way she had made decisions, so the chronology, the, the movement, uh, choices of subject matter and so forth. So the, the show, I think, is pretty tightly focused. I hope it, you know, it, it uh, that it allows the, the work to speak for itself without a lot of didacticism. Um, and, but of course, you know, if you, if you, the more you want to sort of get under the surface or dig deeper, you know, there's some information on the labels and, uh, and there is a wonderful catalog. I don't know if that answered the question or not, but enough. Another question back there? There's a microphone coming, just one sec. So what happens to the pieces that she abandons? Like, where do they exist? They throw, they're, they're gone. She they're, destroys them? Yeah. Have they you don't ever, hang around. Have mm -hmm. you ever seen an edit of mm -mm. what? No, you've never even seen a nope. failure. No. Nope. I would say she's very private about the studio. Um, I have to say this also goes back to her childhood when she was a young person in Indiana. Her, her bedroom was her refuge, and that's where she drew and it was her private space. And I think that paradigm still holds, that her studio is a very private space. She doesn't let a lot of people in. And she, I have to say, it was only, I mean, I have now seen works in process, but she's not, she does not show that very much. Uh, and, um, and she has almost no work of her own. I mean, she has, there are only, I don't know, a handful of works that she still, has kept, um, and as I said, sometimes, okay, I'll share a secret. The, the Japanese book, which is one of my favorite paintings, is the front of the book, and I know she is working on a back. <laughs> and I only know that from a photograph I've seen of the studio, I've never seen the back. And I have no idea how long it will take or if it will ever emerge. <laughs> 
far back. Uh, there are a couple of things that strike me here, and uh, much of what you had to say has to do with her idea of the physicality of the of the object itself rather than the image and so on. Um, if if that's the project, why the heck is she using paper of all things? Uh, you know, uh, layers of acrylic on paper uh, on which there's charcoal or graphite. It strikes me that that's a particularly fragile, evanescent kind of <laughs> material to use. I mean, all of the things I, 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 I've heard you say is what I would expect to hear a sculptor saying mm. about stone and bronze, not someone drawing with pencil on paper. I'm assuming the paper is either washi or some acid-free paper, and it's not just going to disintegrate in another year or two. Yeah. Um, but I'm well, just curious about yeah, this idea. Yeah, well, I, I, don't know that, I don't know that permanence uh, is really something that is of fundamental or deep interest to her. Um, it's about the... Uh, you know the 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 uh, uh, gestalt. Let's say you know it's the completeness of that finished image, finished work, not image work, um, and the experience then that one has of that. And she gave up paint because she felt it was still too expressive, it was too uh, voluptuous. Uh, uh, it allowed just too much subjectivity, and she felt that with a pencil, there was more rigor, there was more discipline, uh, there was less of the artist's personality uh, being ending up in the work itself. Um, and of course, I mean, this is true of a lot of artists in the late 60s who were trying to get rid of the personality, get rid of themselves as author. You know, so it's not unique to Selman's, but certainly it's. She was one of the few who actually w had an image as the armature. Most artists who were interested in that gave up image. Um, um, I will say she is very, uh, you know, uh, aware of the material she uses. So, in the ocean drawings, they're on very good paper, and she used it's just one thin layer of an acrylic ground, so that the paper would absorb less of the graphite. Um, and uh, there are two, though, the, there, there are actually two of the large ocean drawings. There's one here, and they were on paper that was too big to get um, non-acidic paper. And that, you'll see that drawing is very yellowish, and that is from the acid over many, many years showing itself in the paper. Um, but she has a very... Um, um, you know, it's kind of very old-fashioned kind of process of making paintings and and drawings. So they're they're quite stable overall. Yeah. I don't I, I don't know how long we get to go here, but you you tell me when you don't want to hand a mic out again. <laughs> how did yeah. you approach the show, um, like from a spatial ex um, perspective? Like, how did you approach it from a curation perspective? Um, well, I, I, um, there uh, the I mean, via works that the um, there are, are are some very you know f uh, finite, definite bodies of work. So the the studio still lives is like one very set group of work. So they needed one gallery, and then you've got the work she made between sixty five and sixty eight, and again there aren't there aren't so many of them. So again, it's a pretty small group, and then you get the oceans, and the oceans are probably the work that she's most identified with. And so I felt there needed to be a bigger space. There needed to be more examples. There's a broader range. She worked on them from 1968 to 1977. And we were able to get, there are very few drawings from 1968 when she started them. There are a lot in 69 and a lot in 70. And then she started doing these experiments with like a, the big paper. There are only two of those. The long extended one, there are two of those. Um, I didn't talk about, there's something called a painting with a cross. Uh, there's two of those. So some of the examples of the unusual variations, but then more typically to show the full range of the, the way the ocean drawing developed. So the very last ocean drawing, which is, there are only a couple drawings from 1975 and only one from 77. And that's where the image goes, again, almost flat. 
and it and smaller and tighter, unlike the early drawings, which are this you know you really feel more of the sense of the ocean of space and so on. So and so the and the night skies uh, I wanted with the paintings to again show the range from the really tight, dense black ones to the luminous shimmering gray ones. Uh, I have to say we did a lot of talking, convincing people who have those paintings to let them out of their frames and out from their glazing. So if you see anybody getting too close, move them away. Um, and um, um, the chalkboards, again, which have been sort of a sustained series of work since starting in roughly 2007, so there's a nice group of those. But there are these little sidebars, you know, like, again, this, the webs are, there are very few of them. Uh, the majority of the webs are actually here in the show. Um, so it was a combination of a kind of a, of a, a rhythm uh, from uh, these small focused bodies of work to the ones that were more expansive, where they lasted longer periods of time, where you see more variety and variation in them overall. We have time for two more questions. Okay, I see the hands. Let's <laughs> see the Hi. mics. Uh, the very early uh, works uh, that she did of uh, objects in her studio, um, they kind of remind me of, of Mirandi in a way because he's, yes. he uh, just did of objects yeah. in his studio or what he could see from his yeah. window. Was there any? Yes. Uh, when she uh, went to she went to New York uh, while she was still a student, not very often, but she, and she happened to see a Mirandi show, and uh, she's very explicit that that was very important for her. It was the first time. I mean, she'd been looking at Abex, you know, looking at de Kooning and Pollock and so on, and you know, big paintings, gestural paintings, and and that's what she was kind of trying to do. And Mirandi was like the first time she saw a small painting with incredible focus. Needless to say, gray, and they're definitely that they're very much in the background of those studio still lives. Absolutely, there. Yeah, I didn't get into it. I didn't want to get it so much into the art history, but there, uh, there's a, a lot of uh, a lot that could be talked about, written about in terms of her relationship to other artists. She's, you know, um, I will say, and I thought this was interesting. She was in L.A. at the time when the Pasadena. Museum of Art was showing Warhol, Duchamp, um, uh, pop art. She never saw any of those shows. She was in her studio. She was pretty isolated. She didn't know many people. Uh, and she didn't see those shows. People might have talked about them, probably did, but they were very indirect. Uh, uh, but Mirandi was definitely an influence. In fact, uh, the. Uh, I think Tate did a Mirandi show, and uh, Via contributed something to the catalog on that, which I again, haven't looked at in a long time, but it's definitely there. Yeah. And I, I had a long conversation with her about Mirandi while we were installing the show this time. <laughs> yeah. I just wanted to say that um, the very first time I encountered her work, it was by accident in MoMA, and I just happened to be sort of whipping about 20 some years ago by a drawing um, gallery, and I. I saw that it was a subtle ocean painting or drawing. Ocean drawing, yeah. And just went running in, and it, it just opened. I feel that too. They the have this magnetism Selman's. about them, or something. Yeah. So MoMA, I, one of my uh, places in life. I was a uh, chief curator of drawings at MoMA for five years, and uh, when I got there. Uh, the uh, museum had two drawings. It had an ocean drawing and a moonscape. Uh, both acquired in 70 or 71. This is interesting. And she had a show of her drawings in 1973 at the Whitney. So very early, museums began to collect the work. And then MoMA hadn't collected anything since then. And so it became one of my goals to get a night sky drawing, uh, which you see upstairs. Uh, and, and MoMA has its great collection of work because of a, a Los Angeles collector named Ed Broida, who was passionate about Selman's and collected as much work as possible. And when he died, much of his collection was left to MoMA, some to the National Gallery in Washington. And so MoMA has now the most extensive collection of Selman's work, but it's really because of Ed Broida, the, a private collector. And most of the works, uh, you know, and most museums have one or two, uh, or, and, and, and frequently some prints, 
Um, she's one of the great printmakers, and there's a print retrospective at the Met in 2002 and a great print retrospective in Europe a couple years ago. So we, we've included some prints, but haven't sort of emphasized that. It's a, a really focusing on the paintings, drawings, and, and objects. But, but uh, what's that? There are a lot of prints. Yeah, she's, she, well, a fair number of them. I mean, again, she, get, she spends as much time working on a print as she will on a, on a drawing. And uh, uh, she worked, in the beginning, her, her real interest in, she studied printmaking as an undergraduate. And, um, but her real intensive interest in printmaking began in the early 80s uh, at a, a, a printer in um, Los Angeles called Gemini. And there was a printer there named Doris Similink. And Doris and Vidvia were like, like mutual spirits meeting. And Doris left Gemini and set, made her own print studio, and Vidvia has worked with Doris ever since. Yeah. Well, I think that we'll have to wind it up, but thank you all for coming, and I hope you'll enjoy the exhibition. Thank you.